Alright, so what we did yesterday was we talked about um, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are one of the <coughs> classes of biological organic molecules. We talked about monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are large molecules made of a bunch of smaller monosaccharides linked together. We call that type of molecule a polymer, and it's made of monomers. We'll talk about another polymer today. But lipids are not a polymer. The lipids are a class of molecule. Um, they're not polymers, and they are hydrophobic. Can you, um, can you guess what that word means? Hydrophobic. Don't just hear the water. Yeah, that's what it literally means. And these are molecules that don't mix well with water. Why don't they mix well? Because they probably can't. We just, yeah, well, sort of. Yeah, because they're nonpolar. So these are nonpolar molecules. It include the things that we just mentioned in um, that activity with it. Fats, oils, waxes. So some examples of lipids are fats, also phospholipids, which make up the cell membrane. Steroid hormones are lipids. And lipids provide several functions. They're good at storing large amounts of energy. And when we consume excess calories, the extra energy in our body gets stored as a lipid and that it can be utilized later on. We have fats that surround our organs, helping to cushion the cell membrane, what's called a phospholipid. They also store energy, and I would guess you studied in health the nutrition of fats. Fats contain the most energy per gram, of nine calories for every gram of a lipid. However, they take longer to digest. They're not as quick to uh, mobilize as carbohydrates. Their oils are, lipids are often used in seeds to store energy while the seed is germinating. Until photosynthesis can take over for energy production and then provide the glucose. Lipids are made of the same elements as carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they're found in a different ratio. What was the ratio of carbohydrates? Two to one. Two hydrogen for every oxygen. Lipids do not have that ratio. For example, here is castor oil. Um, that is a, an oil. Its chemical formula is C18H34O3. Lipids have much more hydrogen than they do oxygen. This is animal lard. That's another lipid. That's a solid fat, a saturated fat. It's used in cooking and baking and sometimes. What is lard? Lard is animal fat. So, Lipids, or sometimes we, we call them fats, are made of two components. One glycerol molecule. It's shown here in your notes in green. That's the glycerol. It's a three carbon molecule. Attached to that glycerol are three fatty acids. So these things in red, those are fatty acids. And there's a variety of fatty acids that could be attached to the glycerol. Like here are some examples. Stearic acid is 18 carbons long. Palmitic acid is 60. Butyric acid is 4. So you could have different fatty acids that get attached to the glycerol. And these fatty acids have this 
group at the end that you're going to see frequently in, in biochemistry. It's called a carboxyl group. It's a group where you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then the other bond is to a hydroxide. That's called a carboxyl group. And you'll see it's on these fatty acids here. This is what the glycerol looks like in a ball and stick diagram, and this is what the fatty acid looks like. Fatty acids are hydrocarbon chains. And that's a member as I can No. So can you guess how is this fatty acid going to attach to this glycerol? The hydrogen attached to the oxygen. What process is going to allow that to happen? Right, dehydration synthesis. Again, we have the two hydroxide groups here. What's going to get stripped off? A water, an H, an H, and an O. And then the carbon is going to bond to the um, to that oxygen, and then that fatty acid will be attached. You guys learned about saturated fats and health. Yeah. Okay. I got a story about saturated and a story about unsaturated fats from my childhood. Saturated fats are animal fats, typically. Um, they are more difficult to digest. And a saturated fat has fatty acids that are all single bonds. It's saturated with hydrogen. That's why it's called a saturated fat. Unsaturated fats have somewhere at least one double bond. And if there's a double bond between the carbons, it means there's no hydrogens here. So that's why it's called unsaturated. Unsaturated fats are easier to break down. Because remember, how do double bonds compare to single bonds in their strength? They're weaker. Single bonds are stronger. Double bonds are weaker. Sometimes you have several double bonds in the fatty acid, and that's an unsat power <coughs> unsaturated fat. So um, unsaturated fats are typically healthier. So they're typically plant-based. They're a liquid, typically. And you can take a, um, an unsaturated fat and make it into a saturated fat. Like you could take vegetable oil, which is unsaturated. And if you add hydrogen in an industrial process, you can make it a saturated fat. It's called hydrogenated. Like hydrogenated vegetable oil. An example of that is Crisco. If you ever cook, bake something, maybe a pie or something, you know what Crisco is? It's like, it comes in like a, a little cylinder and it's this white sort of greasy stuff. It's a fat. It comes from vegetable oil that's been hydrogenated. Is it like a chip or like? No, it's a yeah. paste almost. So when I was a kid. Yeah, like you know, no, it's just fat. So when I was a kid, my mom would, um, she'd use that sometimes to bake things. And I, one time I was, kept asking her, I wanted to taste it because I thought it was like vanilla frosting because it's the same color. So I kept asking her and asking her. She said, no, no, it's not. It's disgusting. Finally, she said, okay, go ahead. Try it. And so I like put my fingers in the Crisco and scooped out. It was like this greasy, slimy, and I took it, ate it, and I puked in the in the sink immediately. It's horrible. Just pure fat. Can I try it? No. I, I think, know. wait, is that stuff when you're like cooking off? Uh, Sometimes you grease like a cookie sheet with it. No, 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 when you're like cooking burgers, like, no. like on a big grill, no, no, no. And then the grease, you turn the grease off, and it turns like this hard and it's a fat mistake. It is. It's, a, it's fat, but it's not that fat. The other story I have about unsaturated fats is also involving my childhood, is when my mom would make fried meatballs, she would save the oil, like you could use it again. You're a vegan. But she saved it and she put it in an orange juice container. And so one morning I got up and I went downstairs before anybody was up, I poured myself a nice delicious glass of orange juice. It wasn't orange. You took a big gulp. And I vomited in the sink immediately. It wasn't orange. It wasn't orange. Well, yeah, it was like, because it was olive oil, it was like orangish in color. And it had been as like cooked meatballs. Did you tell I smell it? I was just got away, guys. How old How are you? Like seven or eight. Wait, wait. All right. So that's all we're really going to say about lipids.
we have a lot to say about proteins. Proteins are an extremely important organic molecule to living things. Another word for protein is a polypeptide. Yeah, nice. Poly meaning many. And proteins are important in all living things. Basically our cells, the structures of the cell, they're built of proteins. The organelles are. Our tissues and organs are made of protein. Ligaments, tendons, muscle, hair. This is all basically protein. Also, many of the molecules involved in cellular communication and enzymes, they are proteins as well, hormones. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions. We'll talk a lot about enzymes probably tomorrow. Hormones are chemical messengers that travel through our blood. Hemoglobin is the protein in our blood that carries oxygen. So all of these things are made of protein. Protein contains energy as well. In, in our diet, protein pr provides uh, four calories per gram. Our body won't use our own protein, typically, in our muscles and so forth for energy, unless it's a last resort. For example, if a person is starving, they have no food, eventually their body will start to break down the protein that makes up their body to get energy. But that's just a survival method. Or if a person is on like a high protein diet and only needs protein, our bodies will convert to using that protein for energy. The one difficulty with using the protein for energy is that the nitrogen that's in it, because protein contains nitrogen, has to be processed by our liver in order to be excreted safely. So eating a high protein diet sometimes can be hard on the liver and hard on the kidney. So this is, we're gonna talk about in a minute, an amino acid, and one of the main components is this amino group. That's where the nitrogen is. And that has to be detoxified in order to be excreted. Is this stuff gonna be in our vegetable next week? Yes. So proteins do lots of different things. They, like I said, they make up enzymes, they make the structure of living things, they store things, they help with transport and communication. Proteins do lots of different things. They're made of four main elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and now nitrogen. So carbohydrates were just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Lipids were carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Proteins have that added nitrogen, and they also have some of the other elements as well. Iron, sulfur, phosphorus. Proteins are very, very large molecules. Thousands and thousands of atoms make up a protein. They have a very complex shape with spirals and ridges and folding, a three-dimensional shape. And a protein is made, a protein is a polymer, so it's made of smaller subunits. The subunits that make a protein are called amino acids. An amino acid, this is the chemical structure. It has a central carbon atom. And then attached to it, there's the hydrogen. There's the carboxyl group. There's an amino group where the nitrogen is. And then there's also this R group. Now, R isn't an element. What this R stands for is a functional group. There are about 20 different functional groups that can be added here, and that forms about 20 amino acids. Linking two of these amino acids together forms what's called a dipeptide, di meaning two, and that happens again during dehydration synthesis. So if you link together hundreds, thousands of these amino acids, you end up with a protein, a polypeptide. And depending on which amino acids were put onto that and what order they're in, that will determine how it folds up and what its shape will be. And the shape of a protein is of key importance. It's 
So if we compare like a protein, a polypeptide, to a, a polysaccharide, polypeptides are much, much larger. And many, many amino acids linked together. For example, insulin is one of the smaller proteins. Its chemical formula is C254H377O75N65S6. So that's a lot of atoms linked together. Others, there's over 1,800 carbons in beta lactic globulin. Hemoglobin, which is found in our blood cells, has 574 amino acids linked together. Do you know what hemoglobin does in our blood? Doesn't it filter out? No, it does make it red. It's responsible for holding something, carrying something. Red blood cells. I'm going to say words. What's the energy? No, it carries oxygen. That's a function of our red blood cells. They have hemoglobin in the red blood cells. It binds to oxygen to carry oxygen. I thought it's like air gets in your blood cells you die. In your, no. It's not in your blood cells. That's in your, in your blood itself. Um, so normal hemoglobin has 574 amino acids. The sixth one is glutamic acid. And that leads to normal red blood cells. However, if a mutation or some change happens, and that sixth one gets changed to valine, some people have a mutation that changed that sixth amino acid, that's what results in sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is um, a severe health problem. Blood cells aren't able to carry enough oxygen. They form these shapes that clog up veins and capillaries. Can lead to early um, mortality. Can lead to a whole host of health effects. Uh, and it's all just because one of these 574 amino acids was changed to a different one. So the order of these amino acids is extremely important. Here's an example of two amino acids being linked together. These are the simplest amino acids, glycine. We have the central carbon, we have the hydrogen, we have the carboxyl group, and we have the amino group. And then we have that R group, the functional group. In this case, it's just hydrogen. It's very simple. So if we combine two of these amino acids together, okay, the hydroxide from the carboxyl group gets combined with a hydrogen from the amino group next door. And what does that form? Water. And then the carbon and nitrogen get linked together. This is an example of what? Dehydration. Synthesis. We've removed water and synthesized, built a larger molecule from two smaller molecules. So this would be called a dipeptide, because there's two of them. Repeat this process hundreds, thousands of times, and we would form a polypeptide, a protein. Here are the 20 amino acids. Yeah. So you'll notice the top part of these are all the same. Because you have the carbon, the hydrogen, the carboxyl group, the amino group. This lower portion, that's what varies from one amino acid to another. They can be simple, like glycine, just a hydrogen, to very complex ring shapes and uh, other long chains of different molecules. And different amino acids, some are nonpolar, like we just talked about. Some are polar. Some have a charge. Some are acidic, some are basic. So which of these functional groups is added on to the amino acid makes a big difference. But these are the 20 amino acids. We can make inside of our own bodies 10 of them. The other 10 that we don't make, we have to get somewhere else. Where do you think that is? In our diet. So 10 of those amino acids we get in our diet, we get them from the foods that we eat. The protein, is, if you eat some protein, it gets broken down, and your body can then get those amino acids that it can't make on its own. Some of these are um, found mostly in animal products. Some are found mostly in 
uh, plant material. Sometimes people that consume no animal products at all, or vegan, might have to be sort of aware of what types of proteins they're eating, because they have to be sure they get all 10 of the missing proteins from uh, the foods that they're consuming. So one of the important types of molecules that proteins make are enzymes. Talk about enzymes before. Enzymes are proteins that help to speed up a chemical reaction. So in living things, chemical reactions take place. Many of them, however, require some help. For example, if you just ate a, uh, an ice cream sandwich, is some of the um, sugars, the starches in that ice cream sandwich, are being broken down in your digestive system. Now they might be broken down on their own, spontaneously, but enzymes in your digestive tract help to speed that up, help that chemical reaction to take place. They're made of proteins, these enzymes, or organic catalysts, they're sometimes called. And what they do is they make it easier for a reaction to happen. They lower what's called the activation. But enzymes are very specific. One enzyme only catalyzes a very specific chemical reaction. For example, if this is sucrose, okay, sucrose is, a, is what kind of carbohydrate is it? Anyone remember? Sucrose table sugar. What kind of a It's a disaccharide. It has two monosaccharides combined. So if this is sucrose, there is an enzyme that we have in our body that helps us to digest sucrose. The name of the enzyme? Insulin. Sucrase. Sucrase, I knew it. Typically, enzymes are named ending with A-S-E. And they're named after the molecule they are working on. So sucrase interacts with sucrose to help it be digested. So some words here. So the enzyme is this green thing. Its shape is very specific, allowing it to sort of connect with whatever molecule it's working on. This would be sucrose. The molecule the enzyme works on is called the substrate. They bind together, and then the enzyme causes a change to happen. In this case, the change happens to be taking that larger molecule and splitting it into two smaller molecules. Those would be called the products of the reaction. Now, if you look at the enzyme, does it look any different? No, it can be reused again. Now a new sucrose molecule could come in. The enzyme could help break it up and release the product. So enzymes are used over and over again. They don't get used up to them. Sometimes there's a special molecule that's needed to help allow the enzyme to form its final shape. We call those coenzymes or cofactors. Oftentimes, vitamins that we take or need act as these coenzymes. You know, the substrate wouldn't fit in to this enzyme without this coenzyme being in place first. So the key thing about an enzyme that allows it to work is its shape. The shape is the most important thing about the enzyme. The area where the substrate and the enzyme bind together is called the active site. That's where the reaction is going to take place. And then the molecule which the enzyme is working on is called the substrate. So this is the substrate. This is the enzyme. 
This is the active site. And then these are the products released. Here's another example. Here's the enzyme. Again, complex shape, fits together with the substrate. And these enzymes work based on sort of where they physically position the molecules. And so once the enzyme and the substrate all sort of connect, we call that the enzyme substrate complex. Now, what did this enzyme do? Something different than the other examples I showed you. Oh, we went together instead of Yeah, what, what would we call this? What's that? Not quite. It's the opposite of digestion. We have a word we use for this. To make a larger molecule from smaller molecules. Reproduction. Synthesis. This is an <coughs> enzyme that synthesized this product from these substrates. <coughs> stop there. We'll come back to that tomorrow. Any questions about proteins or enzymes? <laughs>